I don't believe he's walked out there. What I know unfolded that night and what's been told is totally different. If it all played out and it was the truth, I could believe it, but I don't believe it at all. When we arrived in Gore, most of the town seemed to know why we would be here. The story of the mysterious death of three-year-old Lachlan Jones in January last year. The police investigation is closed. Death by drowning, no suspicious circumstances. But many people in Gore think there is more to this case. So why would he go there? Yeah, well that's a mystery. The little boy's father, Paul Jones, and his friend and support, Karen Maguire, have turned detective, poring over police files, hour upon hour. And for over a year now, they have been asking our investigations team to help them. So at 25 to 10 and you They want the police case reopened. It's not the be all and end all this. The police file. The police file. We know that. They're the experts though, aren't they? Well, do you know in this country that uh, <laughs> we'll start that one again? Yeah. Gore, population 8,000, services some of Southland's best farming country. It is two hours south of Dunedin, or 45 minutes north of Invercargill. Two of the major talking points in this town are the closure of the big department store H&J Smith's after 100 years, and the tragic case of little Lockie Jones. Gore is a small town, right? It is a small town, yeah. So this case is a big thing. It's huge. Everyone's got a view. Yeah, they have. Lockie's dad, Paul Jones, is a Gore courier driver. He knows every street in this town, but was only vaguely aware of the wastewater ponds on its southern edge. The oxidation ponds are vast, dwarfing the Matauda River on the left of screen. They were designed in the 70s to cope with an expected population explosion that simply never came. Just in close to the uh, bank here, he was found. And you were here that night? Uh, I actually didn't see where he was found, but uh, they've put a stick out here where he w was located. Lockie was wearing a high-vis vest and a replica police hat when he went missing. Pretending to be a policeman and arresting people was one of his favourite games. His mother said she did not want to take part in the story. She and Paul split up about six months before Lockie died. It was an unusually hot night, 29 January 2019. According to her police statement, this is what Lockie's mother says happened. At around 9pm, she'd looked at her clock, Lockie ran out of the house, he had a soiled nappy. She caught up with him at her friend's house. The friend said she never actually saw him, but while they were talking, he ran off again. Both women returned to the mother's house before heading to the playground. They returned to look again around the mother's place and then at the friends. The women went along the street towards the river, speaking to people along the way before going down Grasslands Road. The mother says she climbed over a wooden fence beside the gate and went up on the bank looking for a bright yellow vest. At 9.36, she called 111. It was roughly half an hour that he'd been gone. At 11.15pm, around two hours since he'd gone missing, an officer and his police dog found Lockie floating in the water. There was no chance of reviving him. His little replica police hat was a few metres from his body. Close my eyes at night and I still see him and that, but um, I 
I'm positive, 100%, I know my son, in my heart, and the way I brought him up and treated him and that, there's no way he would have walked out here on his own, not unattended. And so nothing will ever convince you? Never, he didn't walk out here. But just too many doubts. Lockie had been sighted by some neighbours on the street. From where he lived with his mum and half-brother to where his body was found is approximately 1.2 k's. We walked it a number of times and it took us between 18 and 20 minutes. Lockie though was three and a half, had bare feet and a full nappy. He would have had to climb a cyclone gate with barbed wire or a wooden fence, walk down a rough gravel road, up an embankment and go all the way down here. And back then it wasn't mowed like it is now, it was long grass, thistles and nettles. Yet strangely, Lockie had no marks or even scratches on his bare feet. We walked out there the next day and in our sneakers and socks and we ended up with little cuts and little bites and you know on, on our ankles. So a little boy would have had some marks on his feet if he was said to have run that way. It just it just didn't add up, it didn't make sense. These photographs from the police file show what the area looked like in January last year when Lockie's body was found. I uh, went to the funeral home, the funeral director, and um, we were seen his body and then I got him and his assistant to check. So they took all his stuff off him and checked it and there's no marks and the pathology report says there's no marks on him as well. What do you think's happened? Do you just not know or? No, it's a mystery. You know, how, how could a little boy run out there and bare feet? It was still daylight when they were searching. You know, how long had he been in that water? At the time in January last year, before the area was heavily fenced, you could access the place by driving down the side of the river on the east of the ponds and through the middle strip, seen at the top of the screen. Do you think there's any chance that in everybody's grief that you are looking for something that's not there? I guess we just want answers. I'm not saying that a three and a half year old boy couldn't run out there. It's a possibility, but it's not probable, in my view. What do you think happened? Either he's been missing a lot longer than anyone's realised. Or said. Yeah, or said. Well, maybe he got out there some other way. Maybe he was taken there. You know, no marks on his feet. So when you went the next day to the ponds, had that area been cordoned off by the police? No, not that I'm aware of, no. It was while we were talking to Paul at the Gore Showgrounds, a place close to home where he used to bring Lockie for outings, that we'd discover that the police had not done a full scene examination following his son's death. When someone dies, like even in a traffic accident, the whole area is cordoned off. Yep. They fingerprint, yep. they look at tyre tracks, they look yep. at footprints. No, I just think that they um, straight away suggested that it was an accident. So they didn't do what they would have done if they considered it anything other than an accident? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Add to that, it would be over a month before key witnesses in this case were even interviewed. And when a series of statements and timings didn't match, no one was ever re-interviewed, nor was there any attempt to establish any type of retrospective timeline. To what I know unfolded that night and to what's been told is totally different in a lot of cases. What do you mean by that? Oh, the ones that have made statements, they're not all true. Um, 
nothing's been looked at. There's a lot of cross-referencing into people's statements that have said one thing and they've done another thing and it just doesn't add up, eh? What is your overall view of the police investigation? Uh, well... You're sighing already. <laughs> I am. Look, I am sighing. We asked Glyn Rigby, a Christchurch-based private investigator and former police officer, to look into some of the concerns we have surrounding the case. If I was going to mark all of the omissions and statements that cause concerns, then um, the file would be a different colour, really. <laughs> Doesn't sound good. Um, the police haven't requested um, cell phone data uh, until almost two months after Lachlan uh, was, was found, which means by that stage uh, text traffic has been lost from some of those phones, not all of them, but some of them. It was requested on the 22nd of March and Lachlan went missing on the night of the 29th of January. So what that means is that the police took so long requesting the cell phone data for some witnesses, it was too late, they couldn't get it. They did, however, manage to get location information and it showed that two crucial witnesses may not have been where they said they were. During the first half hour that Lockie was missing, one of them told police he was out searching a block or two away from Salford Street, when in fact his phone was polling here, on the other side of town in Eastgore, a 10 minute drive away. There is quite a bit of concern about this investigation. It's been described to me as, you know, it's just had a kind of light dust over, and that there are many people that have not been interviewed properly. Some of the statements that police members have taken seem um, poor, where the members perhaps have been inexperienced, but it's been a very cursory interview with, with neighbours and potential witnesses. So once over lightly? Yes, once over lightly, and perhaps they haven't grasped some of the, the broader issues that they should be addressing from a more investigative point of view. So what are the repercussions of that? Uh, well, they, they can be, there are a myriad of repercussions really. Um, but obviously if matters aren't investigated properly, whether they're a homicide or um, a missing person or um, something, something more minor, you struggle then to rely on police investigation to reach the right outcomes. Meaning you can get the wrong outcome? You can get the wrong outcome, that's right. If the right questions aren't asked to the right people at the right times, then it can obviously pervert the outcome of an investigation. The road down to the oxidation ponds, it was rough, it was rocky, it was prickly. Would you expect to find something on the boys' feet? Well, that would seem likely, given the environment, um, bearing in mind that the post-mortem was conducted by a clinical pathologist, not a forensic pathologist. So just explain for us the difference between clinical pathology and forensic pathology. Well, clinical pathology is the um, study and identification of diseases based on laboratory analysis of tissue and fluid samples. Whereas forensic pathology is uh, determining the cause of death by examining the deceased um, and it requires a different skill set than a, than a clinical pathologist. So why wasn't the forensic pathology carried out? Would, should there not have been? Uh, well I would think so. Um, the only forensic pathologists available are in Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland. Right. Um, I don't think they have that capability in Invercargill. Or Gore. Or Gore. Mm. We asked the Gore police for an interview. They thanked us for our request but declined, adding police acknowledge that a thorough investigation was completed into the tragic circumstances of the accident. Accidents happen, tragic accidents happen, and I accept that. Um, but this file would have to be so thorough for us to accept it. And at the moment it's not. We thank you for the days of life which he had. The death of Lockie Jones has had a big impact on Gore. There are plenty of people here who believe that the little boy didn't wander off and drown in the oxidation pond. Our own investigation finds that the police jumped to a quick conclusion and didn't do a thorough job on this case. In Jesus' name.
The Gore Council has a similar view. It is being prosecuted by WorkSafe for failing in its duty to ensure the area was safe. But the council is pleading not guilty. Newsroom understands the cornerstone of its not guilty plea is that the police investigation was inadequate and Lockie's death was no accident. So this is where my son's been buried and I come up here every day. Every day? Yep, every day I come up here. I miss him that much that I come up here and spend a wee bit of time as much as I can. I just sit, like to sit here and talk to him and it's like he's still here at times. I know he's not but I think sometimes he might be able to still hear me.